Ford is one of the um, lead leaders of Alt Expo. He's been very, he's been a crucial organizer of making this all come together. And Antigone Darling is the host of Sex Lies and Anarchy, which is a weekly podcast. Um, actually, is it still a podcast? It's still a podcast. Or is it like a video cast? Or it's on YouTube sometimes. So anyway. She does a really awesome show called Sex, Lies, and Anarchy. And um, today they are going to debate thick versus thin libertarianism. Um, and so to start off, I think the first thing we should do is ask each of you to define what you think thick and thin libertarianism is and where do you see yourself on that spectrum. Who wants to go first? The one with the notes. Notes guy. Hi. So, um, so anyway, so hi. My name is Nick Ford. Um, so, um, so thick and thin libertarianism. So this is a debate that was started on uh, an essay of, uh, by Charles Johnson, who's a noted uh, left libertarian thinker. Um, and so he has this this, uh, this essay called Libertarianism Through Thick and Thin, um, where he uh, defines these things. So basically, in a nutshell, thick libertarianism is the idea that libertarianism is a bundle of concerns. It's not just the NAP and property rights. Um, they're actually um, extra social commitments that libertarianism uh, libertarians, as libertarians, should be interested in. Um, should be critiquing or engaging or disengaging from. Um, the thin libertarianism is basically the idea that um, that basically the NAP and property rights, or pretty much all there is to libertarianism, uh, you you don't need anything besides those things. You can have other concerns, of course. You can be concerned about cultural uh, norms like sexism and racism and homophobia, but they're not a part of libertarianism per se. There's no, there's no, um, it doesn't, the libertarianism don't, doesn't have anything to say about those things as libertarianism. Um, they're just, you know, things you should oppose because you're a good person and all that. So, um, so that's basically the, the, how I define it. I don't understand why such a small group wants to have all these barriers to entry and why it's important to own the L word. I don't even use that word anymore. Glenn Beck uses that word. Rand Paul uses that word. And I thought it's supposed to be about not telling people what they should or should not do because whenever you say something is moral or not moral, you're putting your own judgment on it. And so it's simple enough to say, you know, don't go around killing people, you know, or hurting people, and everything else is cultural preference. So, I don't hang out with bigots. That's my preference. And um, I was told earlier today that I go back and forth between thin and thick libertarianism. I, can anyone define aggression even? I don't think we've all, like, agreed on what the nap is. I'm not a big fan of that. So, we're, we don't agree on anything. That's kind of the beauty of it. So, yeah. That's my position. So I guess my next question would be like, you're gonna have to answer this question about other people. Who, who do you think are some good examples of thick libertarians and thin libertarians? That's gonna maybe be easier for Nick to answer first. Jeez, I'm not an expert, I just, I just know a few things. Um, so anyway, um, so yeah, so uh, for thick libertarians, um, I say some good examples. Um, are Charles Johnson, who wrote the original essay. Um, lots of le left libertarians, although not all left libertarians, are uh, tend to be thick libertarians. Um, and that's a whole other discussion that I'm not going to get into because, you know, I know everyone's scared of divisions. Um, so anyway, um, besides, besides Charles Johnson, there's other um, libertarians like Sheldon Richmond, um, who talks about thick libertarianism a lot, um, and uh, as well as Kathy Reisenwitz. Um, thin Libertarians, um, another a few good examples for that are Walter Block, um, uh, Walter Block, uh, Tom Woods, um, and there's, there's a few others I can think of. Uh, but, the, but the person I'm thinking of, I'm not going to mention. Um, so, um, so anyway, so, um, yeah, exactly, Voldemort. So, um, so yeah, so those are my examples, sorry for all the ums and ums. Well, other than the one who shall not be named, he named a bunch of them. I mean, and those, the ones that you named as thin libertarians, the ones that you named as thin libertarians are like classic writers at this point, you know, and then you have the people now saying stuff about thick libertarianism, people who I would not even consider a libertarian, um, just 
mouthing off about stuff, saying like, Bitcoin is racist. Like, wow, <laughs> really? <laughs> and, and then people pay attention to that. And like, oh, libertarians are like this. No, no, not at all. Bitcoin is anonymous. It is impossible for Bitcoin to be racist. So, yeah, the people that call themselves the libertarians just, I think, I think libertarianism is a big enough pie now that we have opportunistic people coming in, calling themselves libertarians, and trying to get part of that pie, like Len Beck and like Kathy Reisman. Why is everyone Oh, I always pass around mic. Yeah, I was going to go down. Sorry. <laughs> I didn't mean to interrupt things, I was just curious, like, where would each of you guys put somebody like Stefan Molyneux on that spectrum? Yeah, I got a good response to that. <laughs> <laughs> well, I have a few responses to that, most of which I'm not going to say. Um, so one of my responses is that actually, um, I think the, um, this whole, uh, well, one of the, one of the things I think Molyneux is actually good on, um, is, uh, is the, 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 um, the child stuff, the, the um, peaceful parenting, that's the word I'm looking for, that's the phrase I'm looking for. I think, I think peaceful parenting, especially because it's a, a discussion about um, sort of children's autonomy and sort of how far, this is another discussion that will be happening at all textbook, but you know, how far does the NAP extend and how much it doesn't. Uh, I do think Molyneux is actually a thick libertarian, though I know he probably wouldn't call himself one, but I think the way he uses, um, he especially uses some things that Rand does, he, you know, he looks into aesthetics and psychology and stuff like that and tries to integrate that into his libertarianism. So I do think Molyneux is actually a fairly good example of thick libertarianism. That doesn't mean I agree with him. Um, you know, uh, thick libertarians have plenty of disagreements. Um, but anyway, I hope that answers your question. Um, okay, I have big problems with peaceful parenting, actually, because it's called loving your children. And it's really stupid that there's a label called peaceful parenting. I agree. Don't hit people, even if they're smaller than you. It's ridiculous. Um, and Stefan Molly is a social conservative, like, as far as I know, from all the stuff he's been saying and uh, all his single mom hatred. Um, not cool, bro. I was going to say that stuff, but, you know, she went there, so I didn't have to. Okay, cool. I go there. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> I just like to point out uh, that, um, as Nick, I think, was trying to say, and maybe didn't say so well, thick libertarianism and left libertarianism are not synonymous. Uh, Ayn Rand would be considered a thick libertarian because she brought uh, things other than the strict NAP into the concept of libertarianism, such as aesthetics, such as uh, seeing, uh, such as uh, what, such as uh, a certain ethical system beyond uh, just simply just the NAP. She believed there were things involved other than the NAP, and that is a definition of a thick libertarian. Hans Hermann Hoppe is a thick libertarian, albeit a dick. Um, uh, and that is what the definition is of thick libertarian versus thin libertarianism, uh, not whether one has certain uh, left-wing left -wing or uh, the racist sort of concerns. Um, I'm curious to know, Antigone, why do you think Kathy Rice isn't a libertarian? Um, uh, and is this based on uh, uh, the fact that she has... Uh, <coughs> she doesn't define herself as a libertarian. Okay, okay. Maybe she does. She does. I thought she does, but... Okay. Uh, if, why do you think she's not a libertarian? <laughs> so. God, talking to you, man, it's like a brick wall. <laughs> I have yet to see anything. She used to write for... Well, I don't want to have a discussion about a person, but... Yeah, I do. Um, so, uh, articles on uh, thoughts on liberty, uh, things that I've seen, um, and that's a good point that, uh, you know, thick libertarians are not the same as left libertarians, and I would argue that all libertarians are thick, you know, um, and it's just imposing your morality on other people, your own preferences. Um, but to answer your question about her in particular, I have not seen her write anything that's not about all of these other positions. I'm very confused as to why she uses the L word. Um, and yeah, I'm gonna cut it off there. So um, one thing that I think is important to emphasize is that this discussion isn't a movement discussion, and by that I mean no one is interested in reading other people out of the movement. I don't really care if you don't like the labels, or you think this conversation is irrelevant, or you know you think that morality is a spook, or whatever. 
Um, you know, I'm not interested in reading people out of the movement. Like, there was this interview that Tom Woods did with Gary Chartier on Thick and Thin Libertarianism. I really recommend it. It's a good interview. Uh, and Gary Chartier says it pretty openly. He's like, no, one's in, no one that he knows that considers himself a thick libertarianism, a thick libertarian, is trying to read anyone out of the movement. And I certainly don't have any interest in that uh, either. So uh, I just want to clarify that. How about um, Jeffrey Tucker's article about like humanitarian versus brutalist? That, like calling people brutalists kind of, you know, was off-putting. And that seemed to me that he was trying to weed people out of the movement. What do you think? Sure. I mean, I think a lot of people in the libertarian movement are off-putting, so, you know. <laughs> um, so, um, but no, I mean, you know, I've talked to Jeffrey Tucker once or twice about his article, and it's tangential to the Thick and Thin Libertarian debate. It's not the same, um, you know. Uh, and these are all, I think another important point is that these are all archetypes, you know. No one single-handedly embodies one or, one or both of these labels at once, I think. Um, there's a good article by Jason Lee Bias about uh, Thick and Thin PSA, which is all about pretty much that, you know, like, I agree with Antigone, pretty much all libertarians are, in some sense of the word, a thick libertarian in some sense or another. Um, I said some sense way too many times. Um, but, yeah, so I think that, you know, uh, everybody's a little thick, I don't know, every, I don't know, just riffing on that sort of thing. But, um... Yeah, no, I, I think that um, Tucker's article, I really agree with it. I really like the, um, I mean, that, that should be a big surprise, but I, I like a lot of his architectural kind of metaphors and sort of um, ideas about it. I do agree that calling someone a brutalist libertarian is pretty off-putting. It's not something I do. Um, but, you know, hey, I mean, I think I think uh, just to raise, you know, I'm just going to stir the pot some more. Um, you know, I think I think uh, privilege theory is pretty important for libertarianism, but I don't go around telling people to check their privilege. So, you know, um, you know, I just don't do it. I think it's an antiquated term that doesn't have much use and really makes people, you know, feel on the defensive. I don't want to do that to people. So, um, so anyway, I've, I've rambled on enough. Sorry. Do you still have a question? No. Okay. Uh, I, I read that, uh, the article that you were talking about by uh, Johnson. Johnson. Johnson, yeah. And uh, it kind of got me thinking. I, I mostly, at least my initial reaction is, well, no, I'm a thin libertarian, and I, I think everything should be in social standards after that, social preferences. But then I kind of got to thinking, if you take the concept of thin libertarianism to its radical extreme, you can't even have any consequentialist arguments. I, I think that rules that out because, you know, let's say uh, education. Education would be better if um, if uh, we lived in a libertarian world. Well, that's a preference. Like, uh, what if I don't care about the kids or something, you know, crazy like that? Uh, and in fact, you might even say I wouldn't even have any moral uh, objection, uh, any feeling from somebody violating the NAP, I just have this moral rule for no apparent, like this logical thing, this robotic thing, like that's the kind of extreme of a thin libertarianism. And that's kind of absurd, and I think like, naturally we have to have something, you know, I wonder what do you think about that? Yeah, I, got, I have a response for that. Oops, oh, sorry. Um, yeah, um, and I'm actually going to make a point against thick libertarianism here. Um, I think that there's ways that thick, thickness can be taken to its extreme, too. Um, and by the way, I mean, the idea of thickness isn't a new concept. Like, this isn't something that, um, and I know no one's claiming this, but just as a general note, thickness within philosophy has been a long-standing sort, of, um, uh, sort of idea. Um, and I, I haven't read the Wikipedia article in a while, so excuse me, I can't actually define what philosophical thickness is, but it's not that hard to find. Um, but yeah, so um, what, I guess what I'd say to that is thickness can, itself can be absurd. You know, you can have absurd thick views, you know, going back to Hoppe, for example. Um, but, um, you know, you can also, you don't even have to have bad thickness orientations, which I'm not going to argue for. I'm not going to argue what's the correct thickness orientation. All I'm trying to argue is that this conversation is relevant and that the thick side of things is the better position to hold. I'm not arguing for the specific sort of whether you should be left or right. That's a whole other conversation. I don't think we have the time or the patience for it. So, um, you know, uh, so, um, so anyway, I, uh, I hope that answered your question. Let me, let me think, because I was going all over the place, I know. Um, did that answer your question? Yeah, I'm actually more interested in hurricane because it's kind of how, how <laughs> Oh, okay. I guess I'll just I guess I'll just leave. I'll see you later. Check your privilege. <laughs> Check your privilege. 
So you said that you could not have consequentialist arguments if you're a thin libertarian. I don't understand where you got to that, because I do consider myself a consequentialist, and um, I try to not put my own sense of morality on other people. So the concept of thin libertarianism being just about the nap, like I said, we can't even agree on what the nap is. Like, last year, a very drunk, aggressive guy spat on a chick. Now, he didn't hit her, he didn't shove her, you know, did he physically attack her? People are going to have different answers to that question. Furthermore, psychological damage is way worse, I think, it's my opinion, when you gaslight someone, when you make someone doubt their own reality, when you push someone psychologically to the edge of suicide, that is way worse, look, I just violated the nap, than yeah, that, mediator. you know, and, <laughs> yeah, Mycroft, we need a Church of the Sword mediator. Um, so, yeah, I would disagree that you can't make consequentialist arguments. I think that then libertarianism would allow for that. I don't even really get it either, so I, 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 that's why I didn't comment on that. I don't know what to say to that. So maybe we should get to Evan. Um, I'm so excited for this. <laughs> <laughs> two, two points regarding Hoppe. First of all, he's not a dick. You're, you're um, no, he significant doesn't. others wrong. <laughs> And when, in calling him a, a thick libertarian, I'm not really necessarily apologizing him, I don't give a fuck one way or the other what he's called, but are you saying a thick libertarian is someone who believes in the nap and also believes in other things, or they believe it's necessary to believe in the other things in order to be a libertarian? Yeah. Like, if, if, let's say not Hoppe, I know people think this not Hoppe. Hoppe believes in the nap and also doesn't like gays. Let's say that's exactly what he, that's not what he thinks for the record, it's whatever. But that's not necessarily thick libertarian. Someone who's a libertarian and also likes vanilla ice cream, as long as they're aware that their liking of vanilla ice cream isn't part and parcel of the it's just a second view opinion they also have. Do you know what I mean? That, that would make someone a libertarian if they I say, yeah. if I say, yeah, I believe in the nap. So my understanding is Hoppe says, I believe in the nap. That makes him a libertarian. He also says, societies ought to exclude people with high time preference. I don't think he's necessitating that as being part of the nap. And if he's not, that wouldn't that... If, isn't a thick libertarian someone not just who has other views as a person, but who who says that these other views are necessary to be a libertarian? Do you know what I mean? Like, yeah, I know what you mean. So I don't necessarily think Hoppe is a thick libertarian. He's just a, liberta a, a libertarian that believes in the nap and also has other views that, granted, you find important. Sure. Thanks, Teresa, for that speed run. Um, so uh, yeah, so I'm not going to go into Hoppe because. Um, yeah, uh, I'm, I'll, I'll tackle the other question though, because I actually uh, recently, and uh, by recently, <laughs> I mean 15 minutes ago, um, we read this uh, pertinent article that actually, uh, Sh Sheldon Richmond has this article called Libertarianism Rightly Conceived, and basically um, he's talking about that, he's quoting Charles Johnson's uh, article, which I've already mentioned two times, um, that, you know, um, libertarian, thick libertarianism is about li the coherence of libertarianism, it's not about the, uh, I don't know how to say this, the, the, the possibility of it. Like, I'm not denying that thin libertarians are libertarians. I'm just saying I think that they're, um, I guess there's no real nice way to say this, but I guess I find that their philosophy is less coherent and less, um, what's the other word I could use? I don't know. What? Consistent? Well, yeah, consistent too, but there's something uh, robust. I think it's less, I think it's less robust. Uh, that doesn't mean that it's not there. That doesn't mean that they're not libertarians. Again, I'm not interested in reading people out of the movement. Even Hoppe, I mean, I don't like Hoppe, but I'm not interested in saying, oh, you're not a libertarian. I don't care about but stuff like I that. I think Hoppe wouldn't say Roderick Long is not a libertarian. Say he's a libertarian. We both care the non-aggression principle. Just Roderick Long, let's say, is confused about the necessity of excluding high time preference people or something. Sure, but sure, yeah. Um, yeah, so I just want to uh, say, yeah, I, just, I, I hope that answered your question. I mean, yeah, we'll talk afterwards if you want. Sure, I'll, I'll be running in the opposite direction, but yes. <laughs> so several names were mentioned, and uh, I'm interested in something that's sort of orthogonal to this discussion, but still pertinent. So there was names, there were names mentioned of thick libertarians, some of whom were individualists like Ayn Rand, some of whom were collectivists. And then there was a couple of thin libertarians mentioned who were individualist. I'm just curious if anybody can think of any <clears throat> thin libertarians who are clearly collectivist. In other words, are there only three of the four combinations, and is that fourth combination kind of non-existent? I don't want to keep. Uh, do you have something to say or no? Because I don't want to keep hogging the conversation. <laughs> Well, you said that uh, Ayn Rand was an individualist. She 
definitely like to talk about individuals, but she herself as an individual, but she also used collectivist terms to talk about other people, uh, especially comments she made about uh, the American Indians because she did not like how communal um, certain tribes were or, or what have you. So she definitely did say collectivist things. I'm referencing the perception that objectivism is like individualism on steroids. That's so many so many people people objectivist. <laughs> well, yeah. So that, that was that was a good response. Um, uh, um, Wrong talk. Yeah. So um, you know, I think compared to, to some people, or so some people's sort of frame of reference, I think we consider, for example, the individual anarchist Benjamin Tucker to be, um, you know, a dirty collectivist. I mean, I don't think he is, but I mean, some people here might consider him one uh, because he thought the most perfect socialism could only be had to the most perfect individualism. Uh, and he, he also believed in uh, libertarian value and, um, you know, uh, worker cooperatives, stuff like that, blah, blah, blah. Um, so, you know, and he was extraordinarily thin. I mean, you know, when he talks about, I mean, I agree with, I agree with Tucker on a lot of things. Uh, Benjamin Tucker, that is. Um, but, you know, uh, I still disagree with him that, you know, anarchism doesn't have anything to say about anything except compulsion or the use of violence. I mean, that's pretty much what Tucker thought about libertarianism. So, I mean, he's not the best example. Because uh, I think he is an individualist and not a collectivist. In fact, he hated communists, even even anarcho-communists like Peter Kropotkin. But I mean, I think some people's from some people's framework or reference points, they might look at some of Tucker's positions and say, "Oh, he's a collectivist." So I don't know. That's that's what I'm working with here. That's the best thing that came to my mind. So I apologize if it's not good enough. Do you have any other questions? Any other questions? Are the, um, actually, what are some good examples of um, both thick and thin libertarianism? Okay, so we'll change it. What are the best and worst things that each side brings to the discussion? I think thin libertarians with, you know, lower barriers of entry to using the term, though, like I said, I don't even use the term anymore. Um, well, I mean, I do to the, like, cashier at Goodwill or something, because, yes, I was talking about Porkfest at the Goodwill um, when I was purchasing this dress. So, um, <clears throat> I don't think it's... Yeah. <laughs> I don't think it's really um, a useful term. Um, because everyone's using it. However, thin libertarians are able to say, hey, the nap, don't hurt other people, and a lot of people will, will agree on that. And I think if you take that to its logical conclusion, of course, individualists, for instance, cannot be sexists, they cannot be racists, they cannot be classists, and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Because if you're truly an individualist, then, you know, you end up the thickest of libertarians. We'll, we'll get to you in a second, Derek. Um, so uh, yeah, so um, so I, I have a few responses to this. So I think the best thing that the thick libertarians bring to the discussion is an understanding that our struggle as libertarians isn't just limited to state oppression; that it can also comment and act upon certain cultural prejudices, prejudices or practices or movements that may not have anything to do with the state or um, violence or property violations, etc. Um, which I think brings a, a greater sense of coherence and robustness that isn't going to be found via thin libertarianism. Um, the worst thing I think that, that, and I've already kind of commented on this, is that the, the, this sort of striving for coherence can lead to a bit of, um, and I, I know some here might feel this, or I, I've heard this response before, uh, lead to a bit of a rigidity and a lack of openness um, towards a sort of constantly dynamic and changing conversation um, about society and the way that we deal with nonviolent um, sort of cultural norms and stuff like that that we find uh, harmful to a free society. Um, so the best thing that I think thin libertarians bring, sort of agreeing with Antigone, I think, here, is a reminder that what makes up the core of libertarianism, i.e. the NAP and property rights, are very important and shouldn't just be discarded or thrown away carelessly. Um, so I think, and I think that's, that's a correct opinion. Uh, I think the worst part is that the discarding on their part of considering other things as potentially part of libertarianism is harmful to libertarianism itself. Um, Walter Block, for example, discards it as a matter of taste and preferences. Um, obviously, others here do too. Um, you know, and some people will say, you know, it's all about political correctness or some sort of uh, morality police. 
um, which I don't actually think engages in the conversation very well. Um, so I think, yeah, thin libertarians in that when they make such objections do that to the detriment of uh, the movement and themselves and libertarianism. I'm like, I know Derek got to have a question, but I can't yeah. her. Uh, I would just like to point out uh, to Antigone, um, with all due respect, uh, if you take the opinion that uh, individualism, which you are grouping in with libertarianism, uh, is going to lead to a uh, system, because you can't uh, judge, that is that, well, the position you gave is in fact actually a thick libertarian position. That, that you live that, so, and I think, it, and if anyone feels that something like political correctness, but that something, something like political correctness is unlibertarian. If you think you know annoying social justice warriors are doing something contrary to libertarianism, other than even if they don't involve state force, you are in fact taking a thick position. I just want that to be very clear. That is not that if you are the when you start taking certain things beyond the, the beyond um, a very sort of narrow conception uh, and grouping them in with libertarianism, that is taking a thick position. Um, so there are a lot of people here who probably do not see themselves as leftists at all, who are in fact quite thick libertarians just because they hate, they hate, they think political correctness is unlibertarian. So, just uh, wanted to point that out. Do you want to respond to that, Antony, or should I go to the next question? I'm well aware that that was a thick libertarian position. Fair. <laughs> all right. This question may or may not be fruitful, but do you have any questions for one another? <laughs> Where did you get that dress? No. I thought this talk was tomorrow. So no. I was focused on my later talk today. So no. Where'd you get your shirt? I got it from, uh, my mom bought it for me on Zazzle. It's pretty, uh, it's, it's pretty awesome. She got it for my birthday. So, you know. Hey, at least I'm honest, you know. I didn't, I didn't buy it through my, my bootstrapping my wallet. So, um, I'm sorry. I'm not a good objectivist, I guess. <laughs> Still a kick-ass shirt, though. <laughs> Objectively? Objectively, yes. Bullshit. <laughs> <laughs> Whoa, who said that? You be three o'clock after school. Okay, there are three questions in this row, so we're going to have them go through the questions, and then I'm going to come up, and then we'll answer them. Oh, that works. Tic-tac-toe, man. Hell the game. Do you think that brutalist uh, humanitarian divide, that that roughly corresponds to the thick, thin divide? Are those two camps kind of, in theory, the same? Are they in practice the same? Do individuals identifying as one tend to identify as the other nearly all the time? Uh, what, what are your thoughts on that? Here's a thought. Okay, so on um, most of the things I agree with Ayn Rand, and uh, except on property, uh, intellectual property rights, which I agree with Benjamin uh, Tucker. So I, I just wanted to get your thoughts on where thin and thick libertarians stand on intellectual property rights. Okay, well, I, and all I wanted to do is kind of answer your um, clarification question. I, I didn't want to shout out just without the microphone. Um, the reason I was saying that consequentialist arguments can't be made by a thin libertarian, um, so let's say if you don't believe in the NAP, you can still be, let's say, a thin consequentialist in that you believe that things that people want will be better retained in free society, but that's all you can believe. Because as soon as you say, we'll have better education, you're already making a social, you have a social, uh, uh, you're making a social preference for wanting better education, or women will be better respected in a free society if you want to make that argument, if you're making a consequentialist argument. The other person already has to have sympathy for that same social value, so in a sense that's kind of already being a little bit thick. That's, all, that's kind of the point I wanted to make. So. Let, let's take on the three questions before, yeah. before we get to the fourth. I'm already going to explain. <laughs> I did read the Tucker article, and um, I think he was just putting different wording on the thick versus thin thing. Um, do you differ? I, I slightly differ. Do you, do you want to expand sure. on that? Sure. <coughs> Counterpoint. Um, so um, I slightly differ. I mean, I like I said, I talked to Tucker a few times about this, and I was like, well, 
this seems tang tangential to me. Um, you know, what do you think about that? And, and Jeffrey was like, oh, well, you know, you know, I can see the similarities, but, you know, I wasn't really trying to comment on the thick and thin. Maybe he did, and he just wasn't trying to. I don't know. I mean, I'm not going to read into his intentions. As far as I know, though, um, you know, his, his stated intentions to me was to comment on something different. Um, and I didn't, I really should have reread that article for, for this debate, because I, I forgot, you know, people might bring it up. But, so I can't comment too much more past that. Uh, did you want to answer the other stuff, or...? Yeah. Okay. Um, IP. So many hours debating this with Scott Horton <laughs> one night till like five in the morning, at which point his roommate came out and said, you're wrong, she's right, and shut the fuck up, we need to go to sleep. <laughs> so, and then Scott got on the phone with Anthony Gregory, who like wrote a book and is an anarchist and is against IP, and Anthony had to explain it to him. So for some reason, I couldn't explain it to Scott, but Anthony could, whatever. Um, IP is an invention of the state and cannot be enforced without the state. So, they... <laughs> like, I had a debate with someone and I was actually a little afraid, but at the end he hugged me, so it was okay. But he was a musician, and he's like, well, you know, I, I want to make money for my work. And so I told him, well, then work, tour, sell merchandise. But I, I, want to, I want to sit in my villa in Ecuador and just write stuff and have people pay me. Like, yeah, me too. <laughs> that guy's my hero. Um, so anyway. Um, yeah, so the IP question is really weird to me because thick and thin libertarians don't necessarily take any... It, it's, it's not about IP, so I don't really know how to answer that question because I don't think it's really relevant. Um, so I guess that's all I'll say. I, I mean, I'm against IP. Intellectual property is theft, so, you know, uh, as Kevin Carson said. So I don't, I don't know what else to say besides that. Um, humanitarian, uh, we already touched on that. I don't know how to touch... Again, I don't really know how to deal with the consequentialist thing. That's an interesting idea, topic, discussion, I just, I don't know how to deal with it, so sorry. I can't deal with this man, too many fields. <laughs> Hi. Uh, Wait, you so forgot one of the three questions for her about, yeah, the consequentialist one, right? So he was just clarifying. Oh, oh, you don't want to, there wasn't okay. A, okay. Right. So I was going to comment on the consequentialist question. Um, there we go. <laughs> good. I think that the non-aggression principle is a prescriptive statement. It's an ought statement. So you should not aggress against another person. That's, it's, and I think that a lot of people confuse what the NAP is. It's really just sort of like a, uh, you know, it's an approximation of libertarian theory that comes from homeschooling and private property. Uh, it's, it's sort of shorthand for libertarian morality. Uh, the consequentialist, what he was saying is basically that how can you make um, consequentialist arguments like schools would be good without having values other than the NAP. The problem is that the problem with that statement is that um, consequentialism isn't a prescriptive statement. So saying schools would be good is not an ought statement, right? Saying that there would be less poor people is not an ought statement. Actually, in order to argue a consequentialist argument you have to assume someone else's values. You have to assume that someone values um, less poor people, lower crime, better schools, stuff like that. So just to clarify again, the NAP is saying, do not hurt people. That's a prescriptive statement. Consequentialism is saying, if we follow the NAP, these good things will happen. But those are two, two, two totally different statements. So you, I absolutely believe that you can be a thin libertarian and also make consequentialist arguments. I think that probably the thinnest libertarian of them all was probably Murray Rothbard, and he made untold articles about consequentialism. I mean, he never rested his laurels on morality. So that's just to answer that question, I guess. What? <laughs> okay. Antigone wants to answer you. Uh, it works out better for me personally to follow or adhere uh, adhere to the nap. If I go around hurting people, I'm going to get hurt. So 
it is, it's all, the nap can also be a consequentialist argument in and of itself. You go around being a dick, people are not going to trade with you, people are, you know, not going to associate with you, your life's going to be a little more difficult. Um, and then assuming people's values, when you get right down to it, don't we all have the same? Eat, sleep, fuck, and self-defense, right? That's like a lyric from a song, and like that's, we all want shelter and food and but not all of us want food. I don't know if you guys have heard of Soylent. That's that's a thing. Um, it's not here yet. It will be here next year. A lot of friends have ordered it, but it takes like six to eight weeks from China. Whatever. Um, so, assuming that everyone would want lower crime. All right. So that's another talk. Basically, you're saying is that if you're a consequentialist, you can't be a thin libertarian. Because you're commenting on things other than the nap. What I'm trying to say is that the non-aggression principle is completely compatible with other things. Well, and also I want to point out that just commenting on things uh, outside of the nap doesn't make... Uh, maybe this will muddy the waters. If it does, I apologize. But it occurs to me that just commenting on something outside of the, you know, out of out of the nap doesn't make you a thick libertarian. It's about whether you consider that comment itself a part of libertarianism itself, um, whether you consider it an integral or just a part of it that makes it more coherent. Um, so um, yeah, I hope I hope that doesn't muddy the waters. But um, I think that's important to point out. Um, yeah. So any more questions? I was just going to say that if you if that's how you define thick and thin libertarianism, which I agree with that definition, uh, Nick, you you couldn't uh, you know if you were a thick libertarian, you couldn't even acknowledge something such as maybe a racist libertarian. You'd say, no, uh, you know I think racism is part of my view of thick libertarianism. So there's no such thing as a, a racist libertarianism. It just doesn't exist. It's like a unicorn or a square circle or something. So if you even acknowledge something like that, well, yourself not being you know racist or whatever, that automatically makes you a thin libertarian, just if you say, well, he's libertarian, but he's, an, a, he's a jerk. Uh, if you're able to kind of say that, then you're, I think, by, in some sense, a thin libertarian just by making that statement, if you don't consider their jerk behavior to be part of the definition of libertarian. So, I don't know if you could comment on that. Yeah. If you think you agree with me, because I think I agree with you, but I'm not sure if you agree with me. <laughs> We're libertarians, we can't agree. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Cool. Uh, yeah, we should we should get to that question too. So, um, uh, so anyway, yeah. I mean, I, I kind of stopped following your question after you started commenting about racist libertarians because I just kind of did a mental eye roll. Um, but yeah, no. Um, I think it's a matter of coherence and robustness. It's not a matter of principle. Um, I do think, in some sense of the word, you could. I don't think it makes any sense, and I think it undermines your commitments to the NAP and and other things. But, I mean, you know, you could hold racist views and consider yourself a libertarian. And, I mean, I'm, again, I'm not really interested in reading people out of movements. I'm interested in calling people out for, you know, uh, messed up beliefs and, and, and engaging in dialogue and discussion. But doesn't that make you a thin libertarian, though, if you consider what? them to still be libertarians? Why would that, why would that be the case? Be because then you're not considering, you know, that other aspect to be functional, to be crucial to the definition. Of well, again, it's not about cruciality; it's about coherence. So I, I don't, I don't think, I don't think to have a certain theory, you need it to be completely 100% coherent. Um, I just think that you know it needs to have some basic fundamentals that make sense, and then I think you know robustness and coherence are important values. So I think we should add on to that. I, I don't even think adding on is the best way to phrase it because it makes it sound like Christmas ornaments or something. But but that's not really what you know that's not really what anti-racism and, and stuff like that is that this is these aren't colorful christmas ornaments they're important things that i think yeah. libertarians should be concerned about uh, and engage with um so i know a few people have other questions should we get to them before well actually i'm looking at the time and i think um i'm going to ask one last question sure. and then if anybody has any other questions you can catch up after because we have to start another talk at two do you feel like the, the thick versus thin debate is something that's reconcilable within the whole I think thin libertarianism is useful to bring people in at, like as a starting point. And we use the word libertarian 
you have to think of your audience. Because some people will say that, you know, Rand Paul's a libertarian because he wants smaller government. Well, I'm an anarchist, um, or as I like to say, an atheist of all things. And I just like A-words. Um, so, <laughs> that, you know, you get introduced by a book or by a movie or, you know, whatever. And then as you read more, you know, assuming that your interest is piqued, then you would either become a thick libertarian or whatever. It, it almost seems to me that it's like, you know, outer circle of people and then you're, you find people of your thickness and that becomes, you know, your preferred inner circle or something. So is that, is that how it's reconciled then? Sure, so I wrote down a few things for this. Um, so I think the distinctions between the two ideas uh, are within a spectrum or a gradient. Uh, some are thicker on other things uh, than others within certain contexts. Uh, most of those contexts we haven't even gotten into. There's certain actually, there are certain kinds of thickness. I didn't. I don't want to get into that because I think that'll just it'll be too much. So we, we if you want to talk to me about what I'm talking about right now, we can get in that after. Well, not after because I'm on a polyamory panel, so I kind of shot myself in the foot with with that. Also, I need a water bottle after this. Um, but, uh, but no, so anyway, um, so some are, you know, so supposedly universally thin and don't care about what happens, morally speaking, as long as things are voluntary, not aggressive, respecting other people's property, etc. Meanwhile, a thick libertarian might say that the relationship that, ha that has all of these things can still be, depending on the context, definitions, whatever, could still be objectionable in some way, in some moral or whatever way. Um, they would say perhaps that criticism, social bo boycotting, education, and so on, could be part of an important process in undermining uh, potentially, potentially or actually existing problematic relations between people. Um, so to a certain degree then, the positions are obviously not totally uh, reconcilable, um, but the differences aren't always as extreme as some people make. Uh, and I mean, I, I, it's again, I, I don't, I want to make this clear, and maybe I didn't quite make it clear before, but this isn't a master, this isn't a matter of strategy and tactics, you know, I'm not saying that thick and thin libertarians shouldn't work together, or that, you know, uh, you know, that I don't have any thin libertarian friends, and like I only have my randest inner circle that we all talk about uh, how lovely objective aesthetics are. Um, so, you know, so I, I don't think the inner circle thing is a, is a good, I mean, you know, I enjoy a libertarian circle jerks as much as the next guy, you know, so, um, so, uh, yeah, so, I'm saying so is too much. <laughs> Try to follow up with a joke, but I had nothing, so. Circle jerk thing. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> and with the circle jerk, we'll end this conversation. Thank you guys for attending. <laughs>